Oh, one day as I was walking oh, walkin down, down, down the lonesome road, my Lord, angel came unto me, just to bear my heavy
gather this afternoon in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit with the words of Jesus Christ in mind who said I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he die yet shall he lives and whoever believes lives and believes in me will never die I want to welcome you to uh, this place we're so glad to be able to host this celebration of life today Uh, we welcome friends of the crab family the crab family Rachel uh, we, um, our hearts have been with you, our prayers have been uh, for you in these past few weeks. Uh, about two years ago, we gathered, and Larry was with us, and we had a very special celebration. We got to honor him while he was able to hear the things that were being said and to uh, reminisce, and we were saddened when we heard that he went to be with the Lord, but we grieve not as those without hope. Uh, We grieve as those who know that this life is not all there is and that there is so much more that awaits us. We rejoice that he is more alive today than ever before, that he has taught about the new way, but now he is with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And he awaits, as we do, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting, and a new heaven and new earth. That is our gospel hope. But CCU is deeply grateful for the life of Larry Crabb. I am personally grateful. I remember the first time I had his name register. I was a church planter who had no idea what to do in counseling people. And so I grabbed his early books and devoured them. And I had the privilege when I moved to Colorado of uh, having Larry and Rachel at uh, Cherry Creek Presbyterian Church for a number of years. Uh, being their pastor, and that was very intimidating. Uh, but not really, because they were so warm and, and welcoming. And, and we got to hear him sort of premiere his soul care conference and, and how helpful that was. And then when I went to um, Reformed Theological Seminary as president, um, I watched as our counseling uh, teachers who are training counselors all, for every kind of ministry, they're going up and they're taking uh, Larry's seminar on spiritual direction and how deeply influenced they were and how that influence then just fanned out to students all over the United States and the world. And then of course coming to Colorado Christian University where he was longtime professor. He was the former chair of our counseling degree program. He was the distinguished scholar in residence and a university representative. He was an advisor to six presidents. He taught many master's classes and seminars and spoke right here in many, many chapels. He really helped CCU grow up, taking us from being a college to being a university. All the while, he's doing this amazing outreach of writing and teaching all around the world. So we are so thankful for him. We're thankful that in 2018, we got to dedicate the Larry J. Crabb Center for University Counseling 
at our campus where we had our lunch today. And as I said to him uh, two years ago, I'll just adjust it a little bit. I said, Larry, may your good work echo through these halls as we serve generation of students to impact the world with the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. And we still feel that way. May his good work continue to have that impact. So to begin our service, let's look to the Lord and dedicate this time to him and to, to pray. Sovereign Lord, Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the giver of life, the giver of our days. We thank you that we can reflect this afternoon on your abundant goodness in the life of Larry Crabb. We thank you, Lord, for friends who have come today to surround Rachel and the family with their love. But most of all, we thank you for the promises of Scripture that there is life and hope for those who are united with Christ Jesus by a living faith. Lord, you are the everlasting God, but we are like flowers which rise up with vigor and glory but quickly fade. So help us to lean upon you, teach us to number our days. We commit this service to you, but we ask that you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice even as we reflect on his legacy for us. We pray this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen. I want to thank you all for being here today and all of you who are joining us via live stream as well to honor Dr. Larry Crabb, my father. I'm Larry's oldest son, Kep. My brother and I actually decided just a little bit ago that we're not going to refer to our father in the past tense because we do believe, like Don just said, that he is more alive now than he's ever been. So I'd also like to thank President Sweeting, Vice President McCormick. Thank you guys for all that CCU has done to allow this to happen today. Um, Dad has spoken from this podium many times, and every time I think of Colorado Christian University, I'll think of my dad. Um, he actually encouraged his grandson to come here, and his grandson is now a junior here, and he also loves this university as well. You'll hear from him later today. I think it's also appropriate to thank someone who couldn't be with us today due to some of the COVID restrictions that are going on in Canada. Uh, one of Dad's very closest friends, Trip Moore, could not join us today. Trip, I know you're watching, and we love you, and we miss you, and we can't wait till we get a chance to see you again. We all knew that this day was coming. We've known it for almost 25 years. Dad has battled cancer for that time. And we know that God's timing is perfect, and it sure was with Dad, but I don't know if it prepares us anymore for this kind of a moment as we, get a, as we lose someone like Larry Crabb. We're going to hear from a number of people today, a few I guess, who, uh, who love my dad as well. And the first one we're going to hear from today is my Uncle Lowell. He is my mother's younger brother and he has known dad longer than anyone here except for, of course, my mom. So um, Unc's going to come up and say a few words about dad. Unc, come on up. And uh, give you some insight a little bit into Larry Crabb here. Ladies and gentlemen, Lowell Langford. Uh, so my name's Lowell Langford. I am Rachel's little brother. It's okay to laugh. This is actually a very joyous occasion, as all of you know. Um, the Bible is clear that this is a celebration of victory. And that should be our attitude today. And it's also a real warning and a very, very difficult thing for those who would be here who do not know the Lord as their Savior. So my name is Lowell Lankford. I am Rachel's little brother. 60 years ago, Larry Crabb was my camp counselor. This was a little camp, a, uh, a church camp near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, very interesting, guys. There's a big shadow right here in the middle of this podium. I think I need to stand here and do this. Um, I can't remember what the devotions were. 
um, but there was probably some deep theological thing, some subject that he was wrestling with, and that ended up being our devotions for, the, for that week. So from the perspective of a little kid, this is how I remember Larry. He would come to this conference grounds with his parents and an older brother, Bill. Bill was four years older. Both of them were very good, very good, excellent tennis players. Larry played in college. They were fast pitch softball pitchers. As they grew up, um, I learned to understand that at his home, they had a ping pong table in their living room and had clay tennis courts out back. And so when everyone's trying to figure out how did these guys get so good at table tennis and at tennis, they had courts right at their home. In my home, the ping pong table was in the basement. I don't know about you, but in their home, it was in the living room. My, I remember my mother chuckling about this all of the time and asked Larry's mother about this ping pong table in the living room. And she said, I have two very active boys and I must keep them busy. And that was her response. Ours was always in the basement. As they got older, they both drove fancy cars. I remember Larry had a baby blue Pontiac Le Mans convertible, white convertible, white interior. Can you imagine? And Bill always drove Corvettes. Um, I remember they would blow into camp. All the girls would swoon. Uh, Larry was a bodybuilder. And he was always flexing his muscle at the swimming pool. He wasn't a great swimmer, but he always flexed his muscle at the swimming pool and was always posing. You know, I asked him recently about that, and he said, hey, did you ever know that at really a major competition in my age group, I placed third? He was actually very serious about bodybuilding. Larry and Rachel were in the same grade until Larry took 11th and 12th grades in one year. And that moved him one year ahead of Rachel. And so the ripple effect of that was when her graduation from college came, Larry was in graduate school, his first year of graduate school at University of Illinois and could not take her to all of the graduation events at her school. So I went in his place. Do you remember that, sis? So I went in her place and uh, drove to Philadelphia, and we took care of that. Uh, uh, Larry and Rachel also shared a rather tragic story. Thanksgiving of 1966, Rachel's brother and my brother um, was killed when his airplane failed to uh, gain altitude and it nosedive. He was a very successful medical doctor and real estate investor, and he died at age 31. Flash forward to March third of 1991, Larry's brother Bill lost his life when United Airlines Flight 583 crashed upon landing in Colorado Springs, just down the road from where we are. We would comment on what were the odds of that to have a husband and a wife both lose brothers in airplane accidents. Then there was Elvis. 
No reflection on Larry would be complete without a mention of Elvis. I looked up the top Elvis songs the other day. Number five, Don't Be Cruel. Number four, All Shook Up. Number three, Jailhouse Rock. Number two, Heartbreak Hotel. And number one, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. Not sure how this whole thing started with Larry, but I can tell you it was alive and well 60 years ago. Thank you. I'll give up everything to see the face of God. We'd be hard pressed to find a man who wanted heaven more than Larry. He wanted not only to get us into heaven then, but to get more of heaven's way of relating into us now. It's not often one man will spend his life facing confusion to bring clarity to others, embracing inadequacies to connect with others, facing discouragement to offer courage to others, and pretending about nothing in order to release others from the lies we tell ourselves. But when someone seeks as his highest calling to draw near to God, amazing relationships are born. That is the legacy of Larry Crabb. He was God-obsessed and radically centered on the deepest needs of others. I don't envision heaven as sitting at the feet of Jesus, always feeling a deepening delight in his presence. I do believe such delight will be the center of heaven, but that center will ripple out, perhaps into more and far better books coming from my pen, may be truths so unworldly that they will read like novels. Larry was born July 13, 1944, in Evanston, Illinois. A few years later, Larry's family moved to Philadelphia, where he attended kindergarten all the way through high school. God could have imagined the plans he had for this son of a salesman. At age 10, Larry was awakened in the middle of the night and couldn't sleep. It's then he learned an important lesson. I got out of bed, I went to our little television room, and Dad apparently heard me getting up, and he came into the little room, and he didn't come in and try to do anything, he just sat with me. He didn't say a word. We watched television together for probably half an hour. And then Dad turned to me and said, think maybe you can sleep a little better now? And I remember saying, yeah, I think I could. Why? Because Dad related to me at a very profound level. He was with me. The power of being with someone was a preview of the calling God college years, Larry wrestled with doubt, questioning his faith. He didn't want to simply accept Christianity because it was his family tradition. He needed to know his faith was deeply rooted in his heart. After graduating from Ursinus College in 1965 with a B.S. in psychology, Lawrence J. Crabb and Rachel Joy Langford were married on June 18, 1966. Her maiden name was Rachel Joy Lankford. Her married name is Rachel Lankford Crabs. When she married me, I took the joy out of her life and made her a crab. Just before getting married, Larry began his graduate studies in clinical psychology at the University of Illinois and received his PhD in 1970. It was also in those years that Larry and Rachel's two sons were born. Kaplan in 1968 and Kenton in 1970. From the day they were born, Kep and Ken were Larry's pride and joy. Eventually, Kep and Ken got married. Kep to Kimmy and Ken to Leslie. 
And then the grandchildren came. Josie, Jacob, Caitlin, Kira, and Kensington. If you think you've seen every side of Dr. Larry Crabb, wait till you see him with his grandkids. You have never seen a more thoroughly engaged pop-pop. said if he ever wrote his autobiography, it would be entitled Sovereign Stumbling. You know, I look back on my life and where I've ended up, I had no plans to be here. I had no plans to be a psychologist. I had no plans to be a Bible teacher. I didn't know what I planned. So I've been stumbling along, making all sorts of decisions that I didn't know where they were heading. But looking back, God was sovereign all the way, and he put me in the position he wanted me to be in. So I stumbled. He was sovereign. Larry's career began shortly after graduating from the University of Illinois. He worked a year at the counseling center at the university before he and Rachel moved to Boca Raton, Florida in 1971, where Larry became the director of the counseling center at Florida Atlantic University. After being a psychology professor for a number of years, Larry went into private practice. There he found something he didn't expect. He was being transformed from a psychologist who happened to be a Christian into a Christian who happened to be a psychologist. He continued in private practice until leaving Florida in 1982. Two major callings surfaced during those Florida years. In 1975, Zondervan Publishing published Larry's first book, Basic Principles of Biblical Counseling followed two years later by Effective Biblical Counseling, which quickly became the standard textbook for biblical counseling courses on most Christian college campuses. To say Larry was a prolific writer is an understatement. During his 45 years of writing, Larry published more than 30 books. His body of work is extensive, and it can be difficult to know where to begin. It touches on a variety of topics and themes offers a host of wisdom, and like all of us, has evolved over time. Of the 28 to 30 books that you have written, which one is your favorite and why? I, I really think I can answer that pretty simply without a lot of thought. 66 love letters. What's true of all of his work is that it grew out of his own confusion and curiosity, his own narrow road. You mentioned the marriage builder, for example. That came out of a, a real crisis in my own marriage. Um, I wrote that book shortly after my wife and I had hit a real wall in our marriage. When a woman has a real vision for a man, as I think my wife has a real vision for me, we've written vision letters to each other. And her vision for me when I first let, let her read it to me some years ago just kind of stirred me to new heights. In my mind's eye, I picture you as the tree in Psalm 1. You are a tree, and so many people want to, even demand to sit in your shade. You're planted by streams of water, how else could you make it without that living water? Because no one seems to be a shade tree for you. You yield fruit in season. will not be retiring to golf. Grandchildren are goofing off because he's giving you another fruitful season. The second calling that emerged out of those Boca Raton days came in 1976 when Larry launched the Institute of Biblical Counseling. It's worth noting, in the middle of those Boca Raton years, Larry began to get a glimpse of God's calling on his life, and he was not completely thrilled with the implications. I remember when I first had written a couple of books and was just getting a little bit known, and really became very aware of my calling that I was to get into this, and it was gonna cost me. Um, and we were vacationing, my wife and I and our two young children, who are now 51 and almost 49, so this is back some years. We were in the west coast of Florida, overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. Got up at midnight, everybody was asleep, and I would have this long pier the, into, the, into the Gulf of Mexico. The, the moon was bright, the water was still, it was a beautiful evening. And I walked out about 100 feet into the Gulf in this pier, and I screamed at God for 30 minutes, and I said, I hate my call. The price is going to be too high. Let me out of it. And he didn't say a word, which I presume meant, you're called. In 1977, 
1982, Larry, Rachel, Cap, and Ken moved to Winona Lake, Indiana, where Larry had been asked to begin a Master of Arts in Biblical Counseling degree at Grace Seminary. Over the next eight years, Larry's name and recognition grew, with two of his books, Inside Out and Understanding People, being awarded the prestigious Gold Medallion Book Award. on the journey of the narrow road and those who've gone before us line the way cheering on the faithful encouraging the weary their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly love. May all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we've lived inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we've lived inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. Footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we've lived inspire them to obey. For oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. For oh, may all who come behind us. Find us faithful. 
My name is Jamie Rasmussen. I'm a pastor from Scottsdale, Arizona. And if you had told me back in 1988 when I was halfway through seminary in Chicago, reading that book inside out and liking it, that someday I'd be asked to do a eulogy for the author, I would have thought you were crazy. In fact, if you had told me even 20 years ago when I first met Larry that I would someday give a eulogy at his uh, memorial service, I, I would have thought you crazy. I, I had a very unlikely friendship with Larry, and I need to explain to you why, because it was completely his fault. The reason that I had an unlikely friendship with Larry is because there were two things that Larry was leery of on his best days and antagonistic toward on his worst days, and we all know this, and that was large churches, uh, what we call mega churches, and Bible churches. I don't think he'd mind me sharing that. He was pretty forthright about this stuff. One of the first times I met Larry, this is a true story, you can't make this stuff up, I was his son's pastor, Ken, in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, as well as Dave Martin was an elder in my church, his nephew, and Larry, as you all know, was fiercely devoted to his boys and to his family. And so anybody that was his kid's pastor, he was going to get to know. And so we set up a breakfast together in this little village in Ohio. And true story, he came in and he'd heard me preach the day before. It was Monday, my day off. And he sat down at the table and he said, I just got to tell you, I hate Bible churches. Now, I'm the pastor of a Bible church at that time. And course I'm trying not to take it personal if you drive a Toyota and somebody says they hate Toyotas well they just said something about your car and I said you know being a, a, a trained pastoral counselor I said tell me more and and he did <laughs> and and he said you know if I have to stand up there or sit down there one more time in a church like yours and watch these singers up there sing these choruses with these pasted smiles on their face I think I'm going to throw up. And again, I'm trying hard not to take this personal because I was personally worshiping God the day before. And, uh, and mind you, and, and, and I said to him, well, what would you have us do? I mean, this is how I do church. This is how I know church. What, what more could we do, Mr. Smarty Pants? And, and what he said next changed me, changed me. He said, when was the last time your church ever lamented? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> said, you've read the book of Lamentations, you've read the major prophets, you've read the minor prophets, you've read of John the Baptist. He said, when was the last time in corporate worship your church ever lamented over sin? That your church ever lamented what was going on in culture today? When would you, when did you ever have a, a corporate lament? And of course, I, I was going, well, never. We just don't do that. And he said, maybe you ought to think about it. I, I knew right then that this was a man that I wanted to try to get to know and spend more time with for the simple reason that one nobody ever told me they hated my church at least in my face and and, and secondly uh, very few people challenge my thinking like that you know when I think about how Larry it was used most in our lives and in many people's lives over the years I, I would submit to you that he had an unusually integrated focus upon core biblical truths combined with what he would call a rich spiritual theology that met a person in his or her brokenness, that met a person in his or her woundedness. And what you need to realize, I think we all know this intuitively, but maybe we can put words to it now when we think of Larry, is that it's rare to have somebody who embodies both. A, a, a true core biblical theology, I mean a scholar among scholars, but then also helps you know what to do with that in, in the deepest recesses of your soul. That's what Larry was for me. I think that's what he was for so many people. I, I, again, I don't mean to step on any toes here, but when you think about the landscape of today's uh, biblical or orthodox or evangelical environment, however you describe it, people either gravitate toward, you know, a John Piper or a Brennan Manning. Uh, they might gravitate toward a John MacArthur or a Henry Nouwen, a Tim Keller or a Eugene Peterson. I mean, we tend to gravitate toward our favorites. But in my opinion, Larry had both. I don't think he'd like me necessarily saying he had John MacArthur in him, but he did. Uh, Larry had wrapped up in him. I mean, the, the, the guy would quote John Owen for crying out loud, right? He would read Richard Baxter 
In his writings, he would write about substitutionary atonement and the authority of the Bible and Trinitarian theology, obviously, and pneumatology, the study of the Spirit, and even one chapter in his more recent books on on a high view of God's sovereignty. He didn't consider himself a theologian because he wasn't trained that way, but he could take on any theologian that I knew. He, he, He truly had a philosophical and theological mind. But then not stopping there, he was just ramping up. He would then combine that with this very rich, what we might call practical theology. He called it a spiritual theology that helped people, as the title of one of his books said, find God in very rich and true ways. And all I know is that when he met with me in that restaurant 20 years ago to reach a guy like me with my background and all that I'd come out of and the cynicism and confusion that I currently still battle at times as a pastor to reach a guy like me somebody has to have both which is why I've read Nowen and Manning and 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 Peterson and and and, and all the the more spiritual writers but also read the theological guys I I'm trying to find somebody that'll speak to my soul how about you and Larry very much spoke to my soul because I trusted him theologically I trusted his belief in the Lord and his belief in the scriptures. No doubt about that. But I loved the waters that he would take me into, the deep waters that very few ever did. I remember one time about 12 years ago, I was visiting Denver here interviewing a pastor. And I had to look up Larry. I was in town and he agreed to meet with me for dinner. I was with one of my elders. And again, I don't know about you, for those of you who had uh, you know, a personal relationship with Larry, every time I was with him, I would try to take advantage of that and unload on him, and that night was no different. I was in a space at that time where I was deeply discouraged in my walk with the Lord, and that obviously affected the church, and my elders knew that and all that, and so time to unload on my mentor and friend. And he said, so what's going on? And I said, well, you know, I, I said, I'm, I'm theologically trained, and I, I know what I believe, and I believe it with everything in me, but my experience with God is just so waning. And I can't talk about it because I'm a pastor, and who wants to hear that? I mean, that's kind of, that's not good. And, and I said, but I envy the Pentecostals. I envy the Charismatics. I've asked God to give me those experiences. He doesn't seem to, and my soul is in agony. I just, I, I just don't like it. And, and you guys have heard him say this. He did something with me that, that no one else does. He says, well, it sounds like you're really thirsty. Sounds like you got a lot of thirst in you. I said, yeah, that'd be one way of putting it. I said, I'm I'm more thirsty than anybody would ever realize. In fact, I I live in the desert, and I'm in a desert spiritually, and and I want more, and I just don't seem to get more, and I I don't want to wait till heaven. And he smiled, and he looked at me, and he rocked my world, as he did so often. He said to me, Jamie, have you ever ever considered that maybe the thirst— is the experience. He said, you curse the thirst as if it's something bad, as if somehow God is not in the thirst, as if the thirst is pointing to something more that you just can't have. He said, that's true in many ways. You're not going to get that to heaven. But did you ever think that maybe God is in the thirst and that in the thirst is the experience? I went home that night to my hotel room here in Denver and I Immediately, as some of you are thinking right now, I thought of Psalm 42, verse 1. We used to sing a chorus about this. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. And I just wept in my hotel room. And I don't cry very often. You can ask my dear wife. I wept. I said, could it be that God is right in front of me, that Jesus is right there in that thirst? I never realized it. That was 12 years ago, and I got to tell you, God is in that thirst. I've learned to find him more in the thirst. I'm still really thirsty. How about you? And and that thirst isn't going to be completely parched, I mean, mostly parched, until eternity. The scriptures affirm that, until we see him face to face, until we're clothed with our heavenly dwelling. But Larry, help me. Help me understand where and how God is. And then, as we all know, because he would do this so often. He would use times like that to point us toward heaven. You know, this really is a celebratory day. Forgive the misting up because Larry talked constantly about eternity. Because for him, eternity, rightly so, is the culmination 
It's our final home. It's our destination. It's where there's no more tears. It's where every need we have will be met in the presence of God. And Larry, more than most people I know, longed for that day and wrote so much about it. And Kep asked me to clarify with all of you something rather important here today. And that is the gospel. Again, Larry clung to the tenets of our faith in the gospel. And the reason that we have the hope of where Larry is right now, the very living, real hope, director, though he was, wasn't because he was an amazing husband and dad, though he was. There's lots of those, but Larry was better than most. <laughs> He's in heaven, and he knows this, because he leaned upon the work and person of Jesus. And where he felt short, Jesus loved him most. In fact, Larry defined love that way, right? Looking bad, looking your worst. In the presence of love, that, that, that's what it's all about. And Jesus gave that for Larry on the cross and then through the giving of the Holy Spirit. So don't ever forget the gospel. That's our assurance we have of our dear friend Larry. God sin, Christ in you. God loves you, sin separates. Jesus came for you. And I hope you believe in him. That's our hope that we have for where and how Larry is right now. In closing, before we see the second half of that, that video, which, by the way, is done really well, I just want to say, Larry, I think we all know this, will be deeply, deeply missed. It's a shock to all of us. No, no one will miss him more than Rachel, Kep, Ken, and the rest of the family. We're praying for you. We love you. We stand with you. But I think all of us can say, hey, man, God broke the mold. God broke the mold with Larry Crabb. And I, for the rest of my natural life, however long that is, will hear his voice in my head. I'll continue to read the stuff he wrote and allow him to speak to my spirit and help me find God in my thirst. Why don't you look up here on the screen? In 1989, the Master of Arts in Biblical Counseling program moved from Grace Seminary to Colorado Christian University to the then Foothills campus in Morrison, Colorado. Perhaps the largest shift in Larry's thinking happened during those initial years in Colorado, beginning with the death of his brother, Bill, and culminating with a cancer diagnosis a few years later. He was flying standby, the last one to get on. He was a psychologist as well. From Denver to Colorado Springs, a plane crashed, and all 24, three crew and 21 passengers were killed that day. And I think that was the beginning of the shift that you refer to. Um, when I when I lost my brother, that was the first obvious heart-wrenching tragedy of, of my life of that proportion. And to watch my parents bury their older son. In 1996, Larry was given the honorary title of Distinguished Scholar in Residence at Colorado Christian University. Then, on November 29, 2018, after nearly 30 years of affiliation with the university, CCU honored Larry again by dedicating their new counseling center in his name. In 2000, Larry began the process of launching New Way Ministries and has hosted 77 week-long schools of spiritual direction over the last 20 years. These week-long intimate gatherings around God's larger story came to be known simply by their acronym, SSD. In addition to SSDs, Larry continued writing and teaching as New Way Ministries hosted other conferences, seminars, and webinars all the way to the end. In recent years, Larry has focused significant energy toward launching Larger Story, the legacy ministry started by Larry's oldest son, Kep, to introduce Larry's work and ministry to another generation of Christians. Lawrence J. Crabb passed away peacefully the morning of February 28, 2021, after 23 years of battling cancer. He was 76 years old. But if there's one thing I hope that is said at my funeral, he didn't quit. Yeah, and I will be said. Larry, you never quit.
good? <laughs> All right, good afternoon, guys. I am Jacob, Larry's only grandson. I just want to thank everyone who's in attendance today, supporting our family and celebrating Pop's life. I'm so honored to have the opportunity to speak about my grandfather at my university in front of so many friends and family. I can't even believe that I'm speaking at Pop's funeral. If I'm gonna be honest, it's still a little surreal that he's truly gone, and I don't think I've fully processed it at this point. I was asked by my family to share a Bible verse and some of my thoughts on how Pop impacted me. If I shared every way that Pop impacted me, I'd be standing up here for a long time and you'd probably get tired of my voice. So I'll keep it brief. I've had about a week to prepare for this. If I had a year, I still don't think it would have been enough time. Over the past week, I've been praying intensely and thinking a lot about what it is I wanted to say regarding who Pop was, the life that he lived, and how he impacted not only me, but everyone in here in some form or another. Titus chapter two, verses six through eight. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teachings, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Pop was my hero. Pop was my role model. <laughs> Probably the best role model anyone could ever ask for. If there's one man I should strive to emulate in this lifetime, it's Larry Crabb. If I could turn out to be just half the man he was, I'd be so pumped. Even in some of my earliest memories of Pop, I remember thinking that he was just different, for lack of a better word than anyone else I'd ever met. He truly was a bright light in this dim, fallen world. Everything he did was so intentional. He lived with so much passion. The way Pop lived his life put Christ on display for others to see. He went and made disciples, grew the church, and saved countless lives. I'd imagine when Pop arrived in heaven, God greeted him with open arms and declared, well done, my good and faithful servant. Up to this point in my life, I've never had to deal with a death, not even in my family. I do take comfort in knowing that it was his time. At the end of his life, he was flat out done with this world. He told me that when he got to heaven, he wanted to see Jesus, the apostle Paul, and then his father in that order. He was looking forward to heaven so deeply, yet didn't have the slightest inclination of what it would actually be like. I can only imagine what he's seeing right now. The last time I saw Pop, I had the privilege of knowing it would be the last time I'd see Pop, at least on this earth. My family and I flew down to North Carolina and we spent a week there. On the last day of the trip, before we headed home, I got the chance to say one final goodbye. I asked Pop to keep an eye on me up in heaven and make sure I was making the right decisions. He responded that if he's in paradise next to Jesus, why would he spend his time looking down on this terrible world? <laughs> but for, for me, he'd make an exception. <laughs> before I left that day, I turned around to get one more look at him. He's laying in his bed. We made eye contact, and he gave me a little nod and a grin. And that was more meaningful than anything that could have been said. How I perceived it was, it's okay, Jake. You can do this without me. And even though I may not want to, I can. One of my favorite memories of Pop is back when he and Nan were living at their home in Morrison. I was probably eight or nine at the time. I was hanging out at their house with my three little cousins, Caitlin, Kira, and Kenzie. 
I remember Pop was writing at his desk, and he asked us not to disturb him. My cousins and I were messing around, and I'm not quite sure what led to this, but I accidentally pushed one of them down. I can't remember who, but she started crying, calling out for Pop. And as a little kid, I thought I was in serious trouble. She, she scraped up her arm pretty bad and was just bawling. I was trying to calm her down, make her, make her be quiet so Pop wouldn't hear. Of course he did. Eventually he came to the top of the stairs and said nothing. Kind of standing there with his hands on his hips looking at me. I was freaking out. He kept not saying anything and just kept looking at me. And if you knew Pop, he had a stare to him. He could, he could eyeball you. After what felt like a really long time, he just said, you want to golf? And I was like, yeah, let's go. Let's go golf. So we took off, and I think we played nine holes or something. And that just really meant a lot to me. I got so blessed to have Pop as my, as my grandpa during such formative years. I just always felt so heard when I spoke with him. I could tell him the most pointless things, and he would always have a response. He taught me so much and was the best mentor. But above that, he was kind of just like a best friend. I'm really going to miss my best friend. I love you, Pop. I hope you're listening. Thank you. Larry was given the honorary title of Distinguished Scholar in Residence at Colorado Christian University. Then, on November 29, 2018, after nearly 30 years of affiliation with the university, CCU honored Larry again by dedicating their new counseling center in his name. In 2000, Larry began the process of launching New Way Ministries and has hosted 77 week-long schools of spiritual direction over the last 20 years. These week-long intimate gatherings around God's larger story came to be known simply by their acronym, SSD. In addition to SSDs, Larry continued writing and teaching as New Way Ministries hosted other conferences, seminars, and webinars all the way to the end. In recent years, Larry has focused significant energy toward launching Larger Story, the legacy ministry started by Larry's oldest son, Kep, to introduce Larry's work and ministry to another generation of Christians. Lawrence J. Crabb passed away peacefully the morning of February 28, 2021, after 23 years of battling cancer. He was 76 years old. But if there's one thing I hope that is said at my funeral, he didn't quit. Yeah, and that will be said. Larry, you never quit.
that day Until then I'll live to hear you say Well done We're going to make a small change in the program. Steve has asked me to play this one, uh, read the words first, and then play the song for you. This is a song by Don Wurtzen, who was good friends of Larry and Rachel, and wrote this song, Finally Home. And as we've heard throughout the afternoon, that was Larry's fondest wish, to be finally home. And he is. Let me read the words to you. When engulfed by the terror of tempestuous sea, unknown waves before you roll, at the end of doubt and peril is eternity, though fear and conflict seize your soul. But just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory and finding it home. When surrounded by the blackness of the darkest night, oh, how lonely death can be. At the end of this long tunnel is a shining light, for death is swallowed up in victory. But just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven of touching a hand and finding it God's, of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory and finding it home, finally home. Thank you. 
Please join us in singing from your program the hymn, It Is Well. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. strange it is to be resting as we are today in the crease between worlds and to know where Larry is today, to know that he is very much alive as Cap and Ken have reminded us today, and to know that he can hardly wait to show us around. My name is Mimi Dixon, formerly Miriam. And it has been my privilege these past years to journey with a soul friend whom I miss very much. Several years ago, I had the privilege of being invited to speak at a conference in Houston that was organized to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Larry Crabb. I learned a lot at that conference about the difference that he has made in Christian counseling with his model and his approach. It was 
especially wonderful to be able to listen to what everybody said and to be able to look and see Larry and Rachel right there in the audience. I regret that Larry is not physically present with us here today to hear everything that has been said from his brother-in-law, from Jake, who did an awesome job, to be able to hear the stories and look at the pictures of that video that was so well done. And now I have the privilege, following Jamie, to be able to speak a word of hope. I think that if Larry had listened to us today and the things that will be shared at the reception that follows in a few minutes, that he would have listened with grace and he would have heard us with gratitude and while at the same time striving mightily to silence his inner critic. For Larry Crabb was one of the most self-aware and brutally honest persons I've ever met. He lived his life out in the open, vulnerable, transparent. I met Larry and Rachel in 2006 when they began attending the church that I pastored. There is so much that could be said about what we learned together through the years that followed enjoying what John Bunyan called profitable discourse. When he was in town, Larry would call me up and he'd say, let's go to breakfast. And we drank a lot of coffee and sat at that table for a long time, sharing what we were learning about our deepening friendship with the Trinity, a curiosity and a longing that we both shared. Those times were precious and I will miss them very much. In this message of hope, I'm going to th share three things with you, three characteristics that I valued in my friend. The first is that you could always count on Larry to tell you the truth. One Sunday morning early in our relationship, as he was leaving worship, Larry leaned down and said quietly in my ear, take me to lunch this week, I have something to talk to you about. Well, I bet some of you have heard that before, and I lost some sleep over it. What does Larry Crabb want to talk to me about? When we met later that week, I sat awkwardly waiting for Larry to initiate the conversation. Finally, he asked, do you worry that your church is not growing? Who says that? He hit the nail right on the head. This is not something I'd ever disclosed to him. I did worry about it. I thought if Jesus is in me and I am alive with him, wouldn't that be contagious? Wouldn't people be drawn to Jesus? Wouldn't they be smitten by him as I have been? There must be something wrong with me. I've disappointed Jesus. All these thoughts were going on in my mind. Unlike Jamie, I didn't put them into words. They were in my mind and Larry broke into my thoughts and he said, well, I ask because I imagine that you do worry about this and you can rest assured your church will not grow. Put that thought right out of your mind. I stared at him in open astonishment. Your church will not grow, he said, leaning closer because you stress the cost of discipleship. You're always talking to us about what we, what we must put down in order to take up the life that God longs to live through us. And Mimi, that doesn't sell. Forget about growing your church in that way and instead keep growing your church deep in fellowship with the Trinity. That's what matters. That's what people really want. That's what Rachel and I are hungry for. You could always count on Larry to tell you the unvarnished truth. I trusted him to do that for me. A second characteristic that I valued about my friend was his deep commitment to spiritual formation, a passion that we shared. 
In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, as there are many who go in by it. But the way to life is very narrow and the road is difficult, and only a few find it. Larry knew from experience that the narrow road is a path that narrows as you go along, requiring grit and determination to persevere. Circumstances squeeze us like a toothpaste tube, forcing what is inside out so it becomes visible. Larry was deeply and personally familiar with the challenges of the narrowing way. As has been mentioned, he spoke publicly about the loss of his parents and his mother's long goodbye through Alzheimer's. In 1991, he lost his brother Bill in the airplane accident. In 1997, he nearly died from a rare and serious form of cancer from which he suffered on a daily basis for the rest of his life. And then he developed leukemia. In his celebrated ministry over all those years as a celebrated Christian therapist, Larry had come alongside hundreds of people suffering under heart-rending circumstances a man acquainted with grief. Illness and loss influenced Larry's imagination showing up in his best-selling books. His experience of suffering taught Larry to energetically seize the opportunity for spiritual growth that comes through the collapse of our dreams. Rather than fleeing adversity as did Job or shaking his fist at God, as did King Saul. Instead, Larry embraced the way of Habakkuk. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop crail fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Larry Crabb discovered a truth that can only be discovered in the valley of the shadow of death. That God's larger story is always the better story for our lives. A third characteristic that I cherished in my friend was his unwavering focus on the end game. One of the things that we discover in the Quaker practice of corporate discernment is to layer the good. It's like a, a sieve. You shake out and everything falls away that is not truth. And what remains at the end is pure gold. One day I received a postcard on which Larry had written the following. His handwriting was a little difficult to discern. He wrote this. I stumbled on a phrase in an 1895 book called The Blessed Dead in Paradise. The author wrote this. We live in the exhaustion of unsatisfied desire. We live in the exhaustion of unsatisfied desire. The Lord is stirring in me such a deep appreciation, he wrote, for all that's yet to come in a world without sin and sadness. In his recent book, Waiting for Heaven, Larry recorded this message from God. To become the person you're most thirsty to become to live as a teller of the larger story, to expand your capacity to love others more than yourself, and to anchor your hope in the anticipated joy of what lies ahead, you must be willing now to live thirsty. Thirsty. Larry confided, more than ever I'm thirsty for God. Sometimes while driving my car, singing old hymns, I cry for joy. I want God. He wants me. 
And sometimes, more often than in earlier days, it's showing up in the way I relate. Larry's restless anticipation echoes St. Teresa of Avila, who wrote, Oh, when that happy day arrives, your soul will drown in the infinite sea of supreme truth. There you will be safe from every misery, naturalized into the life of your God. Isn't that wonderful? You will enter into your rest as you become intimate with this ultimate good. Understand what he understands. Love what he loves and rejoice in what gives him joy. This was the longing of Larry's heart, the core of the conversations that he and I shared. This was the future that Larry anticipated. In a, re in a recent text, he wrote, Mimi, I am enjoying my wonderful family, and heaven is almost in view. I look forward to leaving this world to a much better place. Larry had, as you know, a particular fondness for C.S. Lewis. I decided to conclude these brief remarks with a reading from, from one of C.S. Lewis's Narnia children's books. I will set the scene by providing just a couple words of context. The Christ figure in the Narnia books, as you know, is a lion named Aslan. The four Pevensey siblings figure prominently in nearly every book in the seven, series, seven books in the series. In this selection drawn from the last book, the last chapter, the last page, Aslan explains to the confused children what they're experiencing. Thank you. <laughs> there was a railway accident, Aslan said softly. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The school term is over. The holiday has begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, Aslan no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All of their life in this world and all of their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. In his final text, Larry wrote that he could hardly wait to meet Jesus face to face. He has arrived. He has begun chapter one of the great story. Thanks be to God. Let me first start by saying I'm glad we got to see that entire video and it didn't stop before the, the pictures at the end. And I want to say thank you to someone who's here today who put that video together. Mr. Duncan Sprague is here and you did an outstanding job. <laughs> Dunk, you and I shared a lot of tears over the last few months, but thank you for putting that video together. A lot of tears as we put that together as well. <clears throat> wow. 
what a life lived. I often ask my dad, you seem so depressed. And don't get me wrong, he was a lot of fun. But I think that the fun was mostly my mom. She was mostly responsible for his fun. So. But I would say you seem discouraged, a bit beat down, kind of heavy. You've got a great wife. She's crazy about you. You're crazy about her. You've actually dated her since you were 12. You've got two okay kids, two okay sons. Well, one, one was a real problem. But dad knew how to deal with Kenny well. So <laughs> we counted on that. We counted on that. You've got five, five grandkids who love you, they adore you, and they know Jesus. But you heard it today, dad was aware of something that this world did not touch in him. And he actually called it his deepest desire. His favorite author, you heard Mimi say, C.S. Lewis, would call it the inconsolable longing. My brother actually talked a little bit about that last week at the service in the Charlotte area that he took part in. He talked about that inconsolable longing. But dad knew he was built for another world. He just knew it. Of Larry's two sons, I'm the one who people say favors him the most in terms of what, we lo what I look like. He would often remind me that was a huge blessing for me <laughs> and how grateful I should be. And he would tell me oftentimes, you're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, dad. There's so many things that I could say today about Larry Crabb, but I'm just going to say a few as we wrap up today. The first is, he was aware of how hard this life is, the struggle and the suffering that we're going to all experience. We're, it's guaranteed. It's part of the fall. But he was also firmly fixed on eternity, on heaven, on God's larger story. It reminds me of an example that I saw a few months ago that I think really captures this. The guy who was giving this example is a guy named Francis Chan, who dad knew. He knew, he knew dad as well. He used a rope, but I'm going to use a shoestring. And what we call our smaller stories is the end of that shoestring here, that little plastic piece that you can put it through the eyelets. Well, Dad's smaller story was 76 years long. And we're so excited about that smaller story because at the end of this piece right here, man, I'm going to have some fun. That's going to be a really fun time of my life right there. But if this is 76 years long, then I don't know how long this is, maybe a couple thousand. But let's pretend that it goes on forever. My dad was totally aware of the fact that his smaller story fit into God's larger story. And how did that happen? I had the chance to work with him for the last 20 plus years. My very favorite thing that I got a chance to do in those 20 years more was I got to transcribe the chapters that he would send to me. And when Mimi said illegible handwriting, it was chicken scratch on its best day. But he would uh, send me those pages. I would turn them into electronic copy. But what was exciting is he would actually give mom and I the opportunity to speak into those chapters and talk about how that, how that chapter impacted us. Um, Dad never used a computer. He would fax everything. And quite frankly, he wasn't very good with a fax machine either. <laughs> but he would say, uh, yeah. I think we're heading the right direction. When I forced him about a year or so before webinars on the Zoom became essential, he went in kicking and screaming. And actually, he still never used a computer because quite literally for every webinar that we did, my mom would have to set him up on the webinar. And then the first few, you could see his nose up. Uh, he eventually got a little bit better at it. And it was funny because with dad, he was, um, he was a little strangely proud of the fact that he never used a computer. And most of you know that who know him. During last year's Super Bowl, Kenny sent me 175 pages of Chicken Scratch. It is Dad's last book that he ever wrote, titled It's Too Much. I spent about eight or nine hours transcribing that book so he could one more time sit at a table and edit his work. You saw a picture of that on the, uh, on the, on the video that we did. It was really important. My brother said that he... He sat at that table for four hours and edited that last manuscript of his. I've yet to have, have time, really, to read it, or quite frankly, the courage to read it, but I will, and we'll produce that. He actually left us with two manuscripts that we haven't produced yet, one titled Off Track and the other It's Too Much, and Larger Story will produce those at some point. 
And dad keeps on giving, even on the other side. The second thing that I want to say today about my father, his mom, he loved you fiercely. There's zero question about that. You were his lady. You were his better half. He would say it all the time. You were his fun half. He called you a party waiting to happen. <laughs> he was crazy about you. You can see that throughout the video the whole way. And that example that he's given us has given my brother and I, that's what shaped how we try to love our wives and our children. And if we can be half of that, that he was for us, we'll, we will have succeeded. My dad was a relationally intentional man. As a husband, he was intentional. Ken and I can remember from a very early on age where every holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, of course, Mother's Day, Mother's Birthday, they were all, we were supposed to do something special for mom, make her feel loved, let her know how much we love her. After about 18 years or so of that, we realized that that was pretty important to do. Mom, we love you so much. He was an intentional father. I have so, so, so many stories. <laughs> Jake gave some of them. Ah, it's fun watching you talk. But for our birthdays, when I was 10 years old, Kenny was eight, dad would take us to dinner anywhere, anywhere we wanted to go. My brother, of course, would choose the Boca Raton Hotel and Club. I would choose Wendy's, sometimes Burger King. And that's probably the biggest difference between us today, maybe the only difference. But he would ask us a series of questions in those birthday dinners, questions like, what do you like most about yourself? What do you want to be when you get older? What do you find the most beauty in? What do you like least about yourself? And I've actually listed those questions on LargerStory.com. So if you want to go there at some point and check them out and use those, use those with your children, with your grandchildren, with your friends. And if you see any that I left out, let me know because I want to use those. At 13, he took us individually, when I was 13, took, took me to a golf and tennis resort where he talked about all the stuff that fathers talk with sons about at 13, continued to write letters. Then at 21 years old, he took us all back to that resort, me to a little resort off the coast of South Carolina, where he took the questions that we had been answering for the last over a decade, and he got them bound into a book. The book is titled Controlled by Truth, and it is absolutely one of my most valued possessions to this day. He was an intentional grandfather. He wanted nothing more than for you five to know Jesus. His life put Jesus on display. And I got to see behind the crab curtain, under the table, if you will. But really all of us did. Through his books, through his teaching, through interactions that we've had with him. Whether he was standing up here at this platform, talking to a thousand CCU students, or standing at a, a Promise Keepers convention, speaking to 50,000 men, or talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, or dying in a bed that he died in, he was the same guy. He was a real deal. What you saw up here was what we saw behind the curtain. Dad's favorite book, as he mentioned in the video, was 66 love letters of the many that he wrote. Dad, you were, you were a love letter to everyone who met you. You were a love letter to me. You heard Jamie, Mimi, Jake, even Uncle Lowell talk about he, he spoke the truth in love like no one I've ever known. Towards the end of Dad's life, he would really get emotionally overcome about one thing when he would say, I'm going to see Jesus. That's when he would weep. My mom called me on Sunday morning. Dad. At 2.57 in the morning, our time here, she said, your dad has passed. I said, Mom, take a deep breath. Sit down. I'll get in touch with Kenny. And uh, shortly after that, Kenny called me as he was on his way over to get to mom before hospice. I was going to get there. I was leaving that morning to Denver. A neighbor and a close family friend was taking me. I couldn't get there earlier because of some health challenges that my family's going through. But we had said goodbye. Jake said that. 
we had all said goodbye to Dad. Dad, you had run the race. You finished. And I picture him with his chest sticking out as he breaks that tape, as he sprinted to the end. I still often have conversations with Dad, and I wonder what he's doing right now. Hope he's looking down on this and smiling. And I wanted to end with something that my brother did last week where we really give Dad the opportunity to have the last word. Last few weeks of his life, he did some journaling. Dad's smaller story ended 48 days ago, but he's more alive than he's ever been right now. On February 3rd, 25 days before Dad went home, he wrote this. <clears throat> it's February 3rd, 2021. I expect to die soon. <laughs> Perhaps in a month, maybe two, maybe three. In this remaining time, I so badly want to spend it with my family, especially, mostly with Rachel. Then I long to see Jesus. Perhaps I could call what I'm about to write, but I really don't yet know what words I'm going to put on this paper. My spiritual will and testament, as best I can, I intend to write what's going on in my mind, in my heart, and in my soul. I've never died before, so I'm on virgin territory. It seems very clear that I'm to leave this world, leaving Rachel, all my family, and so many friends, actually leaving them to never see them again until they too come home. It seems so difficult, surreal. The first time experience, I cannot process it. I can only feel a loss that will one day be fully compensated. And he was such a good writer. Even then, even when he wasn't thinking as well. That sustains my grief with hope. We will meet again in a much better place. Dad, you never quit. We have a few copies of Larry's latest book, the last book that he did, which is titled Waiting for Heaven. We actually call it now Arrived, Arrived in Heaven. I'd ask, we brought a few copies here. Please take one if you don't have one. We'd ask to just take one per family. Um, and if you already have one, make sure there's enough. And if you need one and you didn't get one, come see me and I'll make sure you get one. But I'd just like to thank you all for being here today. Thanks for celebrating my father's life with us and with our family. And before, we adjourn to the reception that CCU has put on for us today. I'd like to ask Dr. Mimi Dixon to come back up one more time. Dad loved her benediction. And uh, then she's going to dismiss us after the family exits. Mimi, come close us down. Thank you. In the church at the end of our worship service each Sunday, the whole congregation would stand, so I invite you to stand. And we would declare together the last two verses of Jude. So please join me. Raise your hands if you would. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for coming.